we have two participants are present uh, during this first session, and the third one is missing. I will tell later um, uh, the details. Uh, so we'll have two presentations uh, by the participants, and the third paper will be read. Um, the first uh, person to present during this session uh, is uh, Naomi uh, Menuhin, who is a PhD student at the Department of Jewish History at Ben Gurion University of the Negev uh, in Beersheba in Israel. Uh, and uh, under the supervision of Professor Moti Zalkin, she is preparing her PhD. The topic of uh, the presentation today is um, Dr. Israel Milekowski, the word of a Jewish intellectual in Poland between the two word wars. Naomi, the floor is yours. We have uh, 20 minutes for uh, presentations and some extra time if needed. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, here. Um, I'm very exciting. So, let's start. Uh, in 1946, uh, a book was published in Warsaw dealing with the research regarding hunger disease. The research was conducted in uh, Warsaw during the war time. The photos are going to be a bit uh, difficult to watch. This is one of the best researchers ever conducted on the subject of hunger and its influence over the human body. The research lasted less than a year. Uh, the subject uh, of the research was the Jews living in the ghetto, and the researchers were the Jewish physicians living in the ghetto. The person who initiated the research, managed the research, was a researcher himself, edited the results uh, and, uh, of the research, and was also responsible for smuggling it into the Orient side was Dr. Israel Milikovsky, the head of the medicine and sanitation department in the Judenrat of the Warsaw Ghetto. Milikovsky conducted the research in the introduction he had written to the research, an introduction which is a first and foremost documentation of the life in the Warsaw Ghetto and the man's feelings viewing the reality correctly and understanding it in an almost prolific sense. Please allow me to quote. A torture of the words. I was never caught with feelings of rage as I am now, writing this introduction to this work. The time are not normal, and the work we have done was carried out under unusual conditions, unbelievable ones. I'm holding this pen in my hand and the death uh, that is watching me from every direction uh, penetrates uh, my room. It is staring at me through the empty windows of abandoned and mourning houses in the lonely street, covered with wretched remains of a robbed property. It is difficult to focus, but the storm taking place in my heart is 10 times more difficult. The walk has been stopped. This is the uh, meaningful and the unfinished symphony written by the Jewish physicians in 1942. An important detail which is not to be discarded. The systematic organiz uh, organizing and the editing of the findings were conducted in one of the buildings in the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. This is a symbol for our way of life and the research environment in which we are working. The hunger was a key component in the lives of the Jews living between the walls of the Warsaw Ghetto. The symptoms were reflected in large numbers uh, of beggars in the streets of the ghetto, the many bodies covered in newspapers which have filled the, the streets, the death toll uh, in the houses of the refugees, the orphanages and the hospital's records regarding the death from typhus and tuberculosis. A group of physicians suffering from hunger themselves decided to the reality uh, in which they are living must become a subject for our scientific work. 
ignoring the unbearable conditions and the hardships which were completely inappropriate for conducting a research, the physicians completely dedicated themselves to the research. Final words in honor for you, the Jewish physicians. What can I tell you, my beloved colleagues and brothers in suffer and distress? The slavery, hunger, exclusions, and death in the ghetto were your lot as well. Thanks to you, your work, uh, uh, you could say, non omnis moria. Not all of me will die wanting to say that your memory will not be vanished after you are gone. Signed by Dr. Israel Milikovsky, head of the scientific, of the medical uh, medicine department. Very touching. Milikovsky desired that the research shall become a monument, a memorial for the Jewish physicians which were murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto and maybe even for himself. Who was this man? What was his background? What was his outlook? Uh, and what in his life stages if there are, prepared him for the heroic duties that history uh, has provided him with his final duty. I would like to shed some light on his life. So who was he? Well, uh, Dr. Israel Milikovsky was born on July 17th, 1887 to Marian Bela Sowalski. Uh, in the town of Kreva, located in the Oshmiana district, um, considered then a part of Vilnius region in Lithuania, uh, today Belarus. At some point, his family moved to Warsaw, where Israel, Abram, and Fania received a higher education in the University of Warsaw. Following his marriage to Bela Sowalski, the couple's only child, Yanina, was born in 1913. He graduated from the School of Medicine in the University of Warsaw, in the same year, uh, and in the same year, he was enlisted to the Russian army, where he served as a military physician, was captured by the German, and following World War I, joined the Polish army, from which he was released in 1923. Following his release from the army, he started to work as a dermatologist in the Jewish hospital in Warsaw, and at the same time, he opened a private clinic in his house located on 50th Lotus Street, today Palace Cultura. Uh, in the 20s, the Jewish Physicians Organization, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, ZLRP was founded in Poland and Milikowski became an active member of the organization. In the 30s, he became uh, one of its leaders. In addition, he was a member of the TOS uh, organization and also a member of the health organization, Bruce. Uh, throughout the years, in addition to his work as a physician and a public activist, he was a member of the Warsaw Community Committee as part of the At Live Not, Time to Build Party. Um, and published articles uh, in a professional and Jewish press uh, unfortunately, the small family's uh, um, happiness didn't last uh, long since Bella died in 1927 from a terminal disease. That's uh, Jewish physicians in Poland. Okay. On April 23rd, 1936, I'm sorry? Okay, on April 23rd, 1936, the first Worldwide Congress of Jewish Physicians was held in Tel Aviv. The Congress dealt with the status of the Jewish physicians and the medical state in the land of Israel and throughout the world, mainly Europe. 68 representatives arrived from Poland, including Milikowski. Milikowski traveled the land of Israel, met its residents, took notes, participated in meetings, and took an active part in the Congress. Following the Congress, he returned to Warsaw, carrying the, uh, the notes in which he had written his thoughts and feelings following the visit. From his writings, we can see the image of a writer with a strong need for a personal expression and a well-developed uh, historical consciousness. 
Well, Milikovsky arrived to the land of Israel in the days which the land, Poland, had started to burn under the feet of the Poland Jews. The meeting with the land of Israel confronted him with the reality of the diaspora. Milikovsky, a member of the Zionist party, was about to examine his Zionist view. This constant examining was reflected by uh, comparisons between here and there, East and West, modernism and tradition, and between us and them, Warsaw and Tel Aviv. Uh, he was impressed from the land, uh, its resident, and the landscape. It seems as he was one step away from leaving everything behind and remaining in the land of Israel. But Milikovsky was in internal conflict. He was proud of the Zionist project and wanted to be part of it. But throughout the way, he uh, encountered things that reminded him that his place was not in the land of Israel. He was excited by the achievement, uh, but remained an outside viewer. His body was on the shores of Tel Aviv, but his eyes were the eyes of the Jews in the diaspora. The requirement to speak nothing but Hebrew language in those days in the land of Israel, in the daily uh, meetings and scientific gathering as well, did put Milikovsky in a position of disadvantage. He found himself lacking this tool in the land of Israel. Towards the end of the tools, as a physician, uh, as the physicians arrived to the northern agricultural settlement of Yesoda Mala where they were hosted by the local physician, Dr. Strosalski. There, by the banks of the Hula Swamp, the physician told them that he and his children became sick with malaria, and um, that he didn't leave the agricultural settlement despite the disease and the, despite the higher price. The physician's medical and moral set of values confront Milikovsky's own set, which is displayed to him like a mirror. There he was, living in the metaphoric swamp of anti-Semitism, standing on the banks of the Achula swamp, metaphorically between the two swamps, was also obligated not to leave his community, and that is why he had to return to Poland. This may be a hint to the future when Milikovsky will, will act as the head of the medicine and sanitation department in the ghetto. If he wanted to, he could have, maybe, he could have used his personal and professional ties in order to save himself, but he chose to stay behind, like the physician in his Sodomala, and until the bitter end in his case. His notes from the land of Israel show a person that is torn between identities, but which uh, determines uh, decisively, I am Polish. And for that reason, he had to return. Following the end of the Congress, Milikovsky returned to Poland and continued his public work. Following the opening of the World War II, Milikovsky became a member of the Judenrat and was the head of the medicine and sanitation department took an active part in the activities of the underground faculty of medicine in the ghetto. Milikovsky entered the ghetto at the age of 53 as a lonely widower. He had died though as well in the action of January 1943. The health uh, and uh, sanitation department he headed was required to deal with three major challenges. A. Medicine and hygienic treatment of the ghetto residents, keeping them health for as much as possible, including prevention of diseases and epidemics and slowing, slowing down their outbreaks. B, advancing the medical research, mainly research of the hunger disease. C, teaching medicine in the ghetto, as reflected by the founding of the Faculty of Medicine, which was active for a year and a half, supported by the University of Warsaw. Milikovsky is mentioned a number of times in the diary of the head of the Judenrat, Adam Chernyakov, was close to him and was a partner to his difficult misgivings in light of the reality. 
prior to the large action in the ghetto, Milikovsky was, a person, uh, was the person which had to declare the death of Chernyakov after the latter had committed suicide. Throughout his time in the ghetto, he had kept connection with the Orient side through his son-in-law, the future police ambassador Stanislav Gayevsky, which was married to his converted daughter, among others. Both of them were close to the Polish underground Aka, but he didn't join them and remained in the ghetto. Alexander Donat, his neighbor, mentioned him many times in his memories. A quote, Dr. Milikovsky lived in the floor above us frequently in the evenings. After the curfew time, he would come to drink a cup of tea and we would play cards and talk about politics until the middle of the night. He was a small man with a devious smile, an enthusiastic Zionist with a remarkable sense of humor. He took his job seriously and used to talk with, uh, with us about it. He used to talk for hours about the constant efforts to fight the hunger and the typhus disease, which hurt the Jewish uh, population badly. He further discussed the state of the Jewish refugees arriving to Warsaw, which were in worse shape. Even though he was a very devoted physician, he couldn't do much under the terms dictated by the Nazis. One day, he arrived shaking with a sad face and looked like he became old. He told me about a case uh, that happened in one of the refugee centers. An eight years old child became mentally sick from the hunger and began ragging and screaming that he wants to, uh, to steal and rob, to eat, to be a German. He further told me that many children died from the hunger in the refugee centers. Milikovsky cried when he told the, uh, that story and we cried with him. End of quote. Therefore, uh, the only medicine uh, for hunger physicians, uh, physicians had in the ghetto was food, but food was not available. In the tragic situation, Milikovsky raised the revolutionary medicine assumption and recognized hunger as a disease. He felt that the world must know about the state of the hunger and struggle and uh, suggested that the effects of hunger uh, be documented by the best medicine minds of the ghetto, and such minds were abundant. In the reality of the ghetto, which includes hunger, uh, desperation, and death, he wanted to see uh, things objectively in a manner uh, disconnected from the tragedy of the situation, and to continue the scientific and intellectual work as part of the fight for normally in an un, uh, in abnormal uh, reality. To let the world know about the horrifying action the Nazis did to the Jewish ghetto. Many physicians entered to the Warsaw Ghetto and they were enlisted by Dr. Milikovsky to take part in the research. The physicians included, I just want to, to say a few words, uh, Dr. Emil Applebaum, the head of the Department of Cardiology in Chista Hospital, Dr. Julian Fleiderbaum, a specialist in internal medicine from Vienna that arrived to Warsaw as a refugee. Dr. Anna Braude Heller, a well-known pediatrician pe uh, from Poland and a medical manager of the Children's Hospital, Bauman uh, Burson. Dr. Mitzlev Cohen from Lodge, a blood disease specialist. Dr. Josef Stein, a converted uh, pathologist uh, and a manager of the uh, Chista Hospital. Uh, and Professor Hirsch Hirschfeld, one of the best specialists in internal medicine and converted Jew as well. Uh, well, Dr. Milikovsky wrote about them, quote, these are uh, people without a future, which have decided in last attempt of will to provide a small donation for the future. When death locks most of them, those who will remain shall continue the mission waiting for their own death trying to complete the research, end of quote. The, re the research was conducted from February 1942 uh, until the great uh, action six months later. 
The physicians performed clinical, pathological, histological, med uh, chemical, biological, and hematological research following the detailed data gathered from the patients. Performing the research was a complex mission. The equipment had to be smuggled to the ghetto. People had to be trained, and the entire operation had to be kept secret. The research population included 70 adults and 40 children. Milikovsky, who founded the research, made sure the research was smuggled to the hands of Professor Witold Orlovsky, who delivered the envelope into the hands of his son Tadeusz, later known as Professor Tadeusz Orlovsky, a renewed expert in kidney and liver um, transplants in Poland, and asked him to hide the envelope and to take it out only after the end of the war. The hunger disease wa uh, was one of the enormous scientific projects uh, uh, conducted sorry, in the Warsaw Ghetto, in particular, and maybe in the entire medical uh, world of that time in general. The scientific results was uh, um, uh, signif uh, significant many years later. In addition, this initiative uh, that couldn't have been carried out without the commitment of the physicians was one of the shocking and reliable testimon testimonies to the physical condition of the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto. And is, and it is a reminder to alternative sites of acts of valor and active work of physicians. During the wartime, Milikovsky continued to view himself as a leader, a physician, and a scientist. As a leader, he was concerned with the public he was responsible for and tried to ease the suffering of the public, to prevent diseases, and to represent the Jewish public in front of the Germans. In the medical field, Milikovsky made efforts in order to prevent diseases and relieve the uh, distress of the patients in the ghetto using the little tools he had, and also made sure a new generation of nurses and physicians will be created for the future. Was the hunger research a memorial project of the Jewish physicians, of himself, was it the need of an education, educated person to continue the intellectual work and to remain human? It is possible that the time of his captivity provided him with a tool to observe horrific sights from the side. Maybe the scientist part of his side wished to examine this phenomenon, or maybe it was his character the human concern and the public responsibility that characterized him in his entire life that allowed him to identify hunger as a disease itself and not as a symptom of a disease and to transfer that knowledge to the future generation of physicians. Indeed, it is appropriate that the hunger research shall become a monument for the Jewish physicians and Milikovsky a particular and to use his own words, non omnis moria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Um, and thank you for being exactly on time. I didn't even use my card five minutes. Uh, um, the next participant of the session today is Dr. Miri uh, Freilich. And I should uh, present her in Polish, but I hope she will uh, forgive me for uh, keeping this role of uh, presenting in English. Um, she was born in Łódź in Poland and emigrated to Israel, and that's the first line of her bio. Uh, but it's uh, the personal element only. Um, but I think it's worth to mention here at this conference. Uh, as her professional details goes, um, she worked as the history professor for many years and uh, uh, worked at the Beit Berg College in Israel, uh, has developed uh, several courses devoted to the Polish Jewry. The topic of Polish Jewry in the 20th century was the coordinator of many uh, conferences and workshops on Eastern 
uh, European Jews, and uh, also um, on the, all the topics related to the Holocaust. Despite, uh, beside that, uh, she's also the uh, author author of uh, books and editor of some publications. And today, um, Miri will present uh, the topic: the role of Beitar movements' uh, leadership in shaping ghettos uprisings uh, in the years 1942-43. Uh, Miri, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, as usual, I'm very glad, happy to be in Poland, uh, as to your personal <laughs> note. Um, now, uh, the Beitar movement is a revisionist Zionist youth movement founded in Riga, Latvia in 1923 by Zev Vladimir Jabotinsky, the leader of the revisionist movement, the first political group who advocated self-defense and organizing a Jewish army. Beitar was and still is linked to the ruling political party in Israel and was uh, affiliated with the pre-Israel revisionist Zionists and the military organization, the Irgun, Irgun Tzvai Lumi, uh, which advocated uh, in 1937 to 1947 military resistance and guerrilla attacks on British uh, strategic uh, points and army bases and fighting against the Arab militia groups. Their aim was to emphasize that the Jews intend to create a national homeland in Palestine. Some of the most prominent politicians and prime ministers in the 70s and 80s of the previous century were Beitar members as young adults. The most famous one was Prime Minister Menachem Begin. He was a prime minister between 1977 to 1983, and he made peace with uh, Egypt. Now, also Itzhak Shamir, who succeeded Begin was also a Beitar member. Uh, Beitar uh, was founded uh, at a meeting of, the, of uh, Jewish youth in Riga, and uh, Jabotinsky proposed the creation of Beitar to foster a new generation of proud Jews who were not afraid of non-Jewish surroundings and were able to fight back if threatened. Uh, Josef Trumpeldal uh, served as a role model for Jabotinsky. He was an ex-Russian officer who fought in the Russian-Japanese war in 1905 and lost his arm. He immigrated to Palestine after the war and settled in an agricultural settlement in the Galilee. He was killed by Arabs in 1920 while commanding a defensive action on, of his settlement and supposedly died with the words, I don't mind dying for our country. Uh, Trumpeldor was referring to sacrificing uh, one's life in order to establish a Jewish state. Dedication of one's life for the cause is also significant in the words of what's called Shir Beitar, uh, the Beitar hymn, written later by Jabotinsky. As, as the song depicts, Beitar youth, move, youth were to be proud, generous, and fierce as Trumpeldor and to be ready to sacrifice themselves for the future state of Israel. Now, I'll read you part of this uh, song so you'll have the gist of what is it all about. From the pit of decay and dust, through blood and sweat, a generation will arise to us, proud, generous, and fierce, Captured by Tar, Yodfat, and Matsada will rise in strength. Now, the name Beitar also refers to both the last Jewish uh, fort to fall in the revolt uh, in uh, 136 AD against the Romans and 
and to the altered Hebrew name Brit Yosef Trumpeldor. I mean, anybody here who knows Hebrew, it's the Tet and the Taf, so it's almost the same. If you didn't understand what I meant, it's not that important, but it's uh, good to mention. Uh, and what he wanted to do is connect Trumpeldor and the, the place Beitar. Uh, and to connect the ancient Jewish rebels with modern uh, Jewish fighters. Uh, Beitar quickly gained popularity in Eastern Europe and in Palestine. It was particularly successful in Poland. In 1934, Poland was the home of 40,000 of Beitar, 70,000 members in Europe. Routine Beitar activities in Poland included military drilling instructions in Hebrew and uh, singing uh, Israeli um, songs in Hebrew. In Poland, Beitar helped to defend Jews against attack of Polish anti-Semitism by the ONR party. In the late 30s, it was clear to Beitar members that immigration from Poland is the only solution for the Polish Jews. Throughout the 30s and early 40s, uh, Beitar took part in illegal immigration of Jews to Palestine in order to violate the British mandate's immigration quotas, which hadn't increased despite the surge of refugees resulting bo uh, from both Nazi, Nazi oppression, genocide, and the general surge of anti-Semitism around the globe. In total, Beitar was responsible for the entrance of over 40,000 Jews to Palestine under such restrictions. During World War II, some of the Beitar members former were former Polish army officers founded in Warsaw the Zydowski Związek Walki, Jewish Fighting Union, participating in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Actually, Mordechai Anilevich, the leader of uh, the other major uprising group, Zhidovska Organizacja Bojova, uh, gained his uh, first military training in Beitar as a young boy. He was uh, the secretary of the Beitar Warsaw Organization before leaving to join and quickly take leadership of the left-wing Zionist Hashomer Hatzair group in Warsaw. In 1939, uh, Menachem Begin became the most promising Beitar leader. A student of law who excelled in his studies and brilliant speaker, he became the leader of Beitar in Poland shortly before uh, the war. As soon as the Second World War broke out the, and Poland was divided by the Soviet and the and the German, Menachem Begin, and many of Beitar's leadership members escaped from the Nazis to the territories occupied by the Soviets and settled in Vilna. However, in 1941, the Soviets arrested many of them. Begin and other Beitar leaders were imprisoned in Siberia. Begin was the lucky one. He was released to join the Polish army uh, and arrived in Palestine in 1943. The other either died in Siberia or released after many, many years and immigrated to Israel. When the Nazis conquered the Soviet-occupied uh, uh, territories in June 1941 and forced the Jews into the ghettos, new and young leadership replaced the imprisoned leadership in and initiated acts of heroic resistance in the ghettos. Some of the members in Beitar's new leadership had military experience after serving in the Polish or the Lithuanian armies in the interwar period. As other young movements, uh, youth movements, Beitar suffered terrible losses and many of its young members were murdered in the death camps. Others fought in the ghetto uprises in places like Warsaw, Vilna, Lachva, and more. Others joined the partisans in the wood. Nevertheless, the image of the Beitar members became negative because it was believed that many of them served 
in the Jewish poli police in the ghettos due to their previous military background in the Polish army. The role of uh, the Beitar members in the ghetto uprising was ignored in Israel due to political reasons as well uh, uh, since Israel up to Menachem Begin's rise to power uh, was ruled by the Labour Party. And it influenced the state political, education, and cultural and educational system. Beitar members were frustrated since the establishment of Israel, and since then, the dispute over the historical memory of the participants in the Warsaw Ghetto up uprising began. Chaim Lazar, a Beitar member who was a partisan and a member of the FPO underground movement in the Vilna Ghetto, was one of the survivors who escaped Vilna shortly before the destruction of the ghetto, and he started rewriting the ghetto uprising history from the Beitar point of view. Lazar's version was supported after his death by Moshe Arens, who served as the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs. In their opinion, Beitar's participation in the Get, uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was deliberately ignored by the Labour and the left-wing parties and youth movement. Indeed, the Labour Party and the center-left parties emphasized the historical events of the um, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as a story of the left youth movement. The textbooks of Israeli educational system ignore the Beitar participation in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and everywhere else. In 1946, the Beitar leadership in Palestine published a pamphlet entitled The Truth About the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The pamphlet written by Adam Halpern, who was a member of the uh, Beitar uh, underground organization, and he described the establishment of this organization and the battles with the Beitar mem members participated in. However, the, the pamphlet did not receive much attention. The feeling of uh, being neglected by history and by their political opponents had a decisive had a decisive impact on Lazar, and he traveled to Warsaw in 1962 in order to collect historical evidences and to interview people for his book entitled Warsaw's Masada, in which he tried to depict the fighting of Beitar's members in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April 1943. Since most of Beitar members were killed in the first two days of the fighting, he couldn't find witnesses to what really happened. Lazar claims that he managed to collect testimonies of the Polish underground members who told the story of the organization. Nevertheless, his book never became part of Israeli consensus regarding the history of the resistance of the ghettos. Only after Arendt published his books, Flags Over the Ghetto, Beitar's version was accepted and adopted even in the educational system. Besides the attempt to emphasize Beitar's participation in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, other dominant members in Beitar who initiated a rowing action in the ghetto were ignored. For example, uh, Josef Glasman, uh, who became the leader of the Beitar in Lithuania in 1937. Uh, in June 1941, when Germany invaded Lithuania, uh, Menachem Begin was already in Siberia, and Glasman was uh, in the Vilna Ghetto when he was appointed as the head of the local pol uh, Jewish police. In uh, January 1942, together with other youth movements, uh, members, Gla uh, Glasman, among others, uh, founded the underground group entitled the United Partisan Organization, the FPO. 
He became the deputy commander of the FPO and, one, and was in charge of its intelligence department. He also commanded uh, two of its battalions. In June, uh, uh, Glasman left the police and became the head of the ghetto's housing department. Because of his underground activities, Glasman had poor relationship with the head of the Judenrat, uh, Yaakov Gens. Gens ordered Glasman's arrest in October 1942, um, and in June uh, 1943, he, uh, Glasman was sent to a labor camp by Gens. Gland Glasman uh, disobeyed Gens and returned to the ghetto several weeks later. After G Gens surrendered, uh, FPO leader Itzhak Wittenberg to the Germans, Glasman left the ghetto for the forest with a group of the FPO fighters. Their objective was to set up a partisan base there. However, in September 1943, the Germans began a serious hunt for the partisans in the forest. He and his men uh, tried to escape to a different forest on October 7th, they were attacked by German force and Glasman was killed. And only one member of Glasman group survived to tell the story. His contribution to the FPO was enormous. His previous experience as an army officer was decisive in training and preparing the FPO members for their planned uprising. Less known uh, resistance action and figures of Beitar took place in a small town called Lachwa uh, in Poland uh, in those days. When the Nazi occupied um, the town in September 1941, a few young people thought of either joining the partisans or organizing a resistance movement. The group was established by five people at the end of uh, April 1942, I'm almost done, uh, led by Itzhak Rochchin, uh, born in the town in 1915. He joined Beitar in 1932, and in 1935, he was appointed the leader. He established a defense group which fought against the attack of the ONR, the anti-Semitic uh, Polish uh, party, and participated in training courses and learned to use weapons. The trainings were organized by the Polish army. The tasks of the group in 1941 were to try and buy weapons and to prepare the use for resistance. The group was clandestine since they were afraid of betrayal from nearby population as well as from certain Jews in the ghetto. Um, after two months, uh, the group was organized, uh, but they uh, knew that um, the Germans are, are going to um, liquidate the ghetto. So, uh, but still they were trying to prepare an uprising. In the night between the 2nd and 3rd of September, the ghetto was surrounded by the police and they realized that in the morning their ghetto would be liquidated. Rochchin ordered uh, the preparation be made for the setting of houses on fire and appointed one person in every house to be responsible to set the house on fire. Certain members of the Jewish community were still hoping that they wouldn't um, be liquidated and they turned against Rochchin. Their arguments were so strong that it was difficult for the underground to take uh, responsibility for uh, the safety of the ghetto by premature uprising against the police sin since it could turn to be the cause of the destruction of the ghetto. Judenrat's chairman uh, Lopatin turned to the Nazi administration with a request not to liquidate the ghetto. He was told that 30 people will survive, but only under the condition that they will help the ghetto liquida liquidation. Lopatin refused and joined the supporters of the uprising. On September 3rd at 10 a.m., the liquidation of the ghetto began. Lupatin set the Judenrat house, uh, house on fire, and that's how the uh, uprising 
started. Um, all the houses in the ghetto were set on fire. Uh, Rochchin uh, was killed by a German soldier uh, and uh, lots of other Jews defendants themselves with axes and jugs. Nevertheless, the Jews were helpless against the armed soldiers and many of them uh, were died. Some of them tried to join the partisans, but uh, most of them also died in the forest. So the rebellion in the Lachva ghetto was organized as a final action of despair because the fate of the Jews was already known. Rochchin and his friends knew the German, what the der German intentions were. They chose to die uh, through fighting. Rochchin, loyal to his Beitar ideology, fought to defend his honor as a Jewish person. This was a significant and resistant action a year and a half before the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, the Beitar ideology motivated these young people to resist against the Germans as an action of despair in order to do what they thought would save their honor as Jews. Thank you, Miri, um, for your um, paper. And uh, now it's the time for the third participant, uh, who, as listed in the program, uh, was supposed to be Mohsen Hamli, a professor from Tunisia. Um, uh, Mohsen Hamli is uh, not present here. Uh, he was refused a visa, uh, but uh, he sent his paper uh, so let me uh, first introduce in few words uh, Professor Hamley, and then um, I will read his paper. Um, Moxon Hamley is, uh, serves as the associate professor at the University of Tripoli in Libya uh, since 2010. He has authored some uh, critical works uh, uh, on uh, William uh, Thackeray, of, uh, on Margaret Trebles, Iris Marduk, Salman Rushdie, Arusha Naluti, and uh, he was also uh, working and uh, writing on the topic of uh, Jews, uh, Tunisian Jews, uh, during the French Protectorate. He has published several texts on various topics uh, related to, his, to the history of uh, Jews in Tunisia, uh, Arab-Jewish relations, and some critical papers on uh, rabbinical works. Um, so let me read his paper, and I would like to tell in advance that it might take more than 20 minutes, and it's not taking my liberty to extend my reading of the text, but we decided, together with the other organizers, to read the entire paper as it was sent, um, as it's well written, and the translators will help us to um, follow the uh, plot of the paper. Uh, so it might be easier to understand it in Polish, uh, because there are so many details in the English, English version. The title of, uh, of the paper is um, Sheikh Rubin Benatia of Gabes, Tunisia, uh, January 1942, July 1943. The base provincial representatives were called Kaid, Kahia, Khalifa, and Sheikh. Tunisia was divided into Kaidats, uh, or provinces. A Kaidat was a subdivided into districts called Khalifats, and Khalifats were also divided into administrative Sheikhats. The Kaid was the governor of the Kaidat. Kahia, Arabic for deputy, was the Kaid's lieutenant. Khalifa, Arabic for deputy too, was the head of the caliphate. And the sheikh, a town or a rural major. All of them were, of course, regional officials of the Ministry of Interior. The last two nominees, caliphs and sheikhs, had not only present their traditional credentials, our guaranteed deed called Hayat, Hayat Daman, attesting their physical and financial qualifications, but also receive a favorable opinion of the French 
civil controller. The post of Kait, or province chief, as it demonstrated shortly, is the prerogative of elite Ottomans whose function was to legitimize the, bay, the base rule in the province under their control. Tunisia was the only North African country uh, to have known a German occupation during the Second World War. There had been Axis forces garrisoned, garrisoned in the sensitive spots of the country since the end of 1940. But from November 1942 to May 1943, the country was utterly under Nazi occupation. Whether under Vichy or Nazi rule, the Jews were requisitions, requisitioned for the compulsory work service. The requisitioned Jews, requisitions in quotation marks, uh, were herded in groups to dig trenches, make tracks across the woods, construct shelters, uh, repair devastated airports, unload ships, and carry fuel and ammo. Some of those working near Tunis uh, were allowed to return home at the end of the day. But those detained in labor camps in various places in the country suffered horrible conditions. As had later been revealed, Jewish elites, whether Moshe Borgel or Rabbi Chaim Belashe in Tunis or Sheikh Rubin Atiyah in Gabes, had to persuade and sometimes bribe their correligionists to go to the labor camps to free the notable hostages. This maneuver soon backfired as the survivors from among the requisitioned Jews felt shocked by the brutal reality that the notables or intellectuals or bourgeois among them were saving their lives and those of their loved ones at the expense of their destitute correligionists. As each kaidat in Tunisia during the colonial period had its Israelite sheikh hut, headed by an Israelite sheikh whose mission was to extort tax from, the, from his correligionists in the best way possible, Hawati Haddad, a Rubin ben Atiya predecessor, was the sheikh of Hama. In, 19, in 1922, Four, and he was a sheikh of Gabes in 1939 until his resignation in May 1941. But he was one of the rare ungovernable subjects of the period. He was disre disrespectful of the Muslims as well as his coreligionists. In a note on him on, May, uh, on uh, the 5th of March 1940, uh, Mustafa Longo, Kaid of Gabes and Narat, wrote that Hawati was, quotation marks, android but needs to be controlled, the end of quotation. And on usher of the town, Haddad does not enjoy the consideration of his administered, spent, spends five days a week in his property in Ketana, and has been implicated in a number of judi judicial affairs. The circumstances required uh, having an active and serious shake. The last two sentences were also part of the quotation. Hawati Haddad uh, was behind the appointment of Rubin Ben Atiya as successor and one of the sing, uh, signers of Rubin's guarantee deed. Having been forced to resign over his insolence and his being considered unmanage unmanageable, torn in the kite's throat, Hawati Haddad convinced the no notable Jews to gather support for Rubin's candidacy of Sheikh to remain the real Sheikh in the shadows, a plan that didn't in fact, work as he wanted. 
his resignation in May 1941, a uh, period during, uh, during which there had been aggressions, uh, aggressions on Jews in the South uh, particularly. Uh, so his resignation in May 1941 for uh, refusal to cooperate uh, with the Vichy authorities precipitated his plan. His dubious and divisive maneuvers, as is demonstrated shortly, almost sent his successor to the gallows. Shortly after the resignation of Sheikh Hawati Haddad on uh, the 3rd of July, 1941, following a series of judicial wrangles uh, with the Qaeda of Gabes and Arad that lasted more, uh, uh, more than four years, uh, Rubin Ben Atiya filled the post of interim sheikh under the supervision of Caliphate of Gabus, Ali Hazem, until his official appointment in January 1942. Born on uh, the 20th of October 1888 in Yara, in Jara, uh, Rubin Ben Isaac Ben Atiya, a trader, had a, son and, had a son and a daughter. In 1941, his fortune was estimated at um, 250,000 francs and his literacy in Arabic and French deemed average. The biblical degree of appointing him appeared in the official journal on uh, the 30, uh, 31st of January, 1942. Among the 12 notable Israelites who signed Rubin's uh, guarantee deed, testifying his physical and financial qualifications were Yaqub ben Kaid Sassimimun, uh, Shalom ben Isaac ben Atiya, Yusuf, uh, Yusuf uh, ben Isaac Shrosi, uh, David ben Khalifa Shrosi, Hawati ben Shalom Haddad, Isaac ben Yosef Mimun, and Amar ben Sheger uh, Bukhobza. Apologies for uh, the um, troubled uh, pronunciation. Rubin ben Atiyah um, admitted having never faced a serious problem while serving as the interim sheikh from July 1941 until his official appointment in January 1942. His woes uh, started when the Germans occupied Gabes in November 1942 and ordered to recruit uh, Jewish manpower from Gabes and Hama to serve the German troops. In the list he sent to the Vichy authority of Gabes figured Hawati Haddad's son-in-law. Son that the former sheikh's son um, son of law was among those seen working in Gabus, like the rest of his co-religionists, uh, co was an offense Hawati Haddad could not bear. But as a reaction on Hawati Haddad's part might backfire and turn the Nazis against him, the Qaeda of Gabus built a case against Rubin and accused him of first, um, surcharging his correligionists during the tax levying. Favoritism uh, in the designation of individuals for compulsory work. Non-payment of Israelite workers' salaries, uh, and then the amount was given. Traffic in ration cards, uh, this time for his poor correligionists. So he had these four accusations. Attached to Kaid's above-mentioned above letter uh, were seven ration cards the Kaid's investigators found in Rubin's uh, office on the, on the 20th of February, 1943. What the Kaid's omitted um, from, May, from his uh, May 1943 letter to Prime Minister uh, Slaheddin uh, Bak Bakush uh, is First, that he had asked Rubin to bring him within 24 hours uh, 
and in the presence of the Israelite committee and Grand Rabbi of Gabes, 120,000 uh, francs supposedly considered Jewish stolen, uh, stolen salaries. Second thing, that the Germans um, erupted into Sheikh Rubin's store on um, January 25th, 1943, where he was in conference when, uh, where he was in conference with other Jews from Gabes and took uh, 15 ration cards. The third, uh, that a few days before their evacuation from Gabes, the Germans stripped him of his chain, his watch, uh, 650 grams of gold and 20,000 francs before making a headlong dash for the Jewish houses and shops to loot them of their gold. Before he could carry out his threat and hand over uh, Rubin to the German authorities, uh, quotation mark, to shoot him, the end of quotation, as he was reported to have promised, Mustafa Longo was himself arrested to the Germans, by the Germans, uh, apologies, by the Germans on March 26, 1943, and he was transferred to Tunis, where he spent 45 days. Upon his return to Gabes, the Kaid reopened Rubin's case, adding that the Sheikh helped the Gestapo on 26 and 27th of March 1943 to loot Israelites of Gabes of their gold and silver. And also that he, quotation mark, assaulted the Kaid's interim, Mr. Jelanik Buhafa, uh, Kahia of Metunia, uh, Metoya, um, and ill-treated him, the end of quotation. The Kaid sought, um, in short, not only Sheikh Rubin's revocation, but mainly his trial for intelligence uh, with the enemy. Rubin's presentation of witnesses to account for the missing ration cards and for his having himself been robbed of about 200,000 uh, francs didn't convince Kaid Mustafa Longo, Edgar Saada, vice president of the Israelite Committee of Gabes, joined Rubin's protest. The day an Israelite delegation of Gabes visited the Kaid to celebrate the liberation of the country from the German that no rich Israelite of the region of Gabes could pretend having been more hard than Rubin himself. But all was to no avail. Captain Molot, Molot uh, civil controller of Gabes, added in his uh, um, July, uh, the 12th of July 1943 report that the Kaid letter the beginning of quotation, involves evidence, evidences and precisions justifying the revocation of the sheikh, the end of quotation, and propose the replacement of Sheikh Rubin. An official letter dated September 17, 1943, revoked Sheikh Rubin and ordered the Kaid of Gabes uh, to instruct the sheikh's case himself. As his revocation meant incriminating him, and given the scale of the accusation, collaboration with the Gestapo, Sheikh Rubin sought justice in Tunis. His lawyer, Paul P. Petrie, wrote to the Secretary General of, Tunisian, of the Tunisian government on November 23, 1943, that quotation, his client filled his duty during the German occupation in a disinterested way, and that he is the object of resentment from his predecessor, Hawati Haddad, who, backed, uh, who was backed by the Kaid. The end of quotation. It is useful, Petri added, again quotation, to open an inv investigation in Tunis to obtain impartial testimonies. The end of quotation. But as impartial in, uh, investigation in Gabes itself, 
Such unexpected turn of events confounded both the Kaid and Hawati Haddad. After fact-checking the details related to Kaid Longo's motifs related to Sheikh Rubin Benatia, Captain Leburhis, uh, Le uh, the newly appointed civil controller of Gabis, wrote to the base advisors on January 22nd, 1944, that the Kaid's allegations behind Sheikh Rubin's revocation were utterly unfounded. After listing the five charges Kaid of Gabes and Arad exposed in his um, 17 and uh, 27th May, May uh, 1943 letters to Prime Minister, um, Captain uh, de Boris asserted that the testimonies of the Grand Rabbi, Vice President of the Israelite uh, Committee, and delegate of the Tunisian government to the Israelite charity had allowed him to conclude the following. A, first point, that the council controller of Gabes has never heard of, complain, of complaints against Sheikh Rubin surcharging uh, the, his co-religionists uh, during tax levying, that Kaid accusations cannot therefore uh, hold. B, that Sheikh Rubin has designated volunteers for the compulsory work and that those who didn't want to work paid to those chose to replace them um, 200 francs a day. The accusation is thus groundless. C that no complaint related to the non-paid salaries has ever been heard. Sheikh Rubin could not have done that. D, that the traffic in ration cards is groundless too. Sheikh Rubin acted under fear or pressure of the Germans. He gave them the ration cards of Israelites having escaped Gabes. While, while impartial um, laborists corroborated the above cited notable Jews' uh, consistent testimonies, Kaid uh, Mustafa Longo refuted them the day these notables met him during his co uh, celebration of the liberation of the country from the Germans. Captain Lebris um, considers uh, Rubin Benatia um, a brave man, honest, uh, and of good morality, but does not have the caliber of the sheikh and therefore um, overtaken by the events. Appearances seemed to have been against him, and that was what motivated the report of Kaid of Iraq uh, and his resignation. The very influent, uh, rich, and unscrupulous Hawati Haddad, who escaped Gabes during the war to find refuge, uh, refuge in Hama, is the origin of the cable mounted against Rubin. Though he has been rejected by the Israelite community and forced to resign as sheikh, he has never ceased coveting in a return to the post he had resigned. Backed by the Israelite notables of Gabes, uh, Leboris pronounces a very unfavorable opinion concerning any positive reappointment of Hawati Haddad. His return as sheikh was seen as calamity. The immediate effect of uh, Captain Leboris's uh, Le convincing letter was a decree appointing Sheikh Rubin Benatia as a honorary sheikh on March 16, 1944. A letter from Prime Minister uh, to Kaid of Arad on uh, April 15, 1944, sealed the case. Kaid Mustafa Longo's effort in his letter to Prime Minister um, to show that he was 
honest in his claim that the allegations against Sheikh Rubin were rather correct and that it was after he was approached by a number of Jewish notables from the Jewish charity that he opened an investigation on February the 20th, 1943, and com confounded him, uh, remain in fact a dead letter. It was one of the rare occasions when Kaid was found wrong. In the aftermath of a Vichy regime, where each avoided the tag of anti-Semite, of anti-Semitist, uh, blatant Kaid Mustafa Longo failed to enlist the friendship of the new civil controller, uh, Captain de Boris. Rubin found himself fighti fighting two forces, the quasi Granada Jews, in quotation marks, or as it's explained in this text, the rich Twansa Jews epitomized by Hawati Haddad, and he was fighting to remind the Maxen oligarchy, the Kaid. The post World War II momentum helped him battle for both of them. Rubin's is in fact a sample story of the conflict for power within what was called the Twansa Jews. While the Grana, Spanish, or Portuguese Jews were rich, educated, and European-oriented, their Tunisian counterparts, called Twansa Tunisian-born Jews, were poor, much like their Muslim compatriots. The Twansa Jews were traders, petty artisans, peddlers, and farmers. The literate among them were salesmen, cashiers, and accountants. The Grana looked with derision upon the Twansa, who considered Asur uh, Grana false Jews. They were literally split. They used to have two different customs, uh, lead to different lives, refer their lawsuits to two different jurid juridical systems, and bury their dead in two different cemeteries, and split dating back to 1741. A split that the French authorities decided to, re uh, to remedy in, 19 in 1899, uh, fusing courts. And in 1944, by fusing both communities all together. But the very lucky of the Twansa Jews who toiled and got rich, as was the case of Hawati Haddad in the region of Gabes, assimilated the Grana customs and looked with the region upon the rest of their Twansa coreligionists. As the post of Sheikh used to bring water to any citizen's mouth, uh, Hawati Haddad had always coveted a return to his previous post as Sheikh of the Israelites to use the Captain Leborin's terms in spite of the hostility of some Israelites in both Gabes and Hama. While Hawati Haddad was Sheikh, his father, Shalom Haddad, headed the Israelite charity of Hama. The Israelites of the region blamed Hawati of accumulating functions of the Sheikh and uh, of Hama. The Israelites of the region, um, apologies, I um, confused the lines, I will repeat the sentence. The Israelites of the region blamed Hawati's, uh, Hawati of accumulating the functions of Sheikh of uh, Gabes, where he lives with, his, uh, um, with that of Sheikh of Hama, where he comes only to collect tax. The Haddad's um, father and son, mismanagement of the Israeli charity, fed suspicion among the rest of the charity executives, though uh, through violent means, Hawati Haddad rejected uh, the charity's designation of Layu Sikhat and appointed himself also as the 
preceptor of offerings during this, during his coreligionist pilgrimage to the temp of Rabbi Yosef Morabi near Hama. Graphic are previous descriptions of Hawati Haddad's conduct corroborating Labouris' opinions, Labouris's opinion of him in his uh, 22nd January 1944 letter cited above. In his letter to the resident general, the deputy civil controller considered the, uh, the Hawati Haddad's literally, quotation mark, redoubtable, the end of quotation, um, the description goes, and this is, again, quotation. Being the creditor of the majority of the indi indigenous uh, civil servants, uh, including the Cadiz of the regional tribunals, uh, tribunal of Gabes, it was almost impossible for this to sue him. The end of quotation. And because he was um, it intimidated, intimidatingly impressive, he was often absent, neglecting recovering, uh, recovering tax, and provided the treasury services. In 1937, with um, more than 700,000 um, francs instead of uh, for, uh, 40, I'm sorry, I'm missing the numbers, uh, with um, 786 francs instead of 44,000 500 francs. This was one of the two men Rubin uh, faced with unprecedented courage. In 1935, the deputy civil controller described Hawati Haddad as someone whose faults are inexcusable and deserve severe punishment. Insolent, quotation marks, um, this word is in quotation mark, um, was the Kate of Gabe's opinion of him in his May 27, 1940 letter to the Secretary General of Tunisian government. Rubin's is also the inspirational story of an Israelite fighting the Maxen oligarchy in the person of Kaid Mustafa Longo. Mustafa Longo's Ottoman and Mameluk grandfather, Mustafa Longo's father, succeeded him, his father of Kaid of Gafsa. And Mustafa ben Ahmed Longo was interim Kaid of Gafsa in 1912 before his appointment of Kaid of Gabes and Iraq. This Maxen elite, elites, notable top ranking civil servants pros, professing in a, in a and uh, vocal loyalty to the Bay of Tunis were so powerful and had always been the country's caids uh, that um, a skirmish from the subject and other could no way destabilize them in the eyes of the Bay. What is unprecedented in this wrangle between the Kaid of Arat and Sheikh Rubin ben Atiya is the complicity of Sheikh Hawati Haddad. In spite of the declared dispute between Kaid Longo and Hawati Haddad over, uh, ever since the early 1930s, we see them coalescing uh, against Rubin to demote him. The notable Israelites' uh, support to, of Rubin didn't please the Kaid. The devil he knew, that this is the reference to Hawati Haddad, and could exploit his weaknesses and will was much better. It is, relevant, uh, it, it is revel, uh, relevant to add that in 1937, Kaid Longo sued Hawati Haddad for malversation of 130 kilos of silver and four kilos of gold he had been entrusted with. As it's plain, plainly expressed in his letter uh, related to, uh, to Rubin's affair, uh, Kaid Mustafa Longo stresses that, one, Rubin was not afraid, even of those he should have been afraid of. And that, second, he, Kaid Longo, 
had not been guided by any personal interest in this affair. These were, in reality, the very reasons why Rubin was tormented to the point of almost losing his life. Longo's regional government was a government of fear, where corruption and concussion uh, ruled to the um, detriment of people's sense of integrity. Being feared was deemed essential for the Maxen state to survive. But Rubin's challenge, quotation mark, of those he should have been afraid of, the end of quotation, whether or not he was aware of it, underscored not only the rising division within the Jewish community, and here are mentioned Zionist, assimilationists, and promoters of the Judeo-Arab alliance, but also the dwindling Marxian government represented by the Kaids and their loitments, on the eve of country's independence. Malcontents will capitalize off Rubin's case to bolster their arguments for legitimacy. Rubin Benatia moved to Israel in 1964, and he died in, 1960, in 1975. Thank you. Chciałem do dwóch referatów się odnieść. Do referatu, króciutko do referatu o Bejtarze. Mówię tutaj tylko o okresie getta warszawskiego. No, sytuacja jest znacznie bardziej skomplikowana niż pani to przedstawiła. Nie będę tu wchodził w historyczne polemiki. Nieszczęście Chaima Lazara polegało na tym, kiedy on w 60 latach na początku przyjechał do Polski, że był natychmiast obstawiony przez służbę bezpieczeństwa i podstawiono mu takich właśnie rzekomych e, bojowców z polskiej strony, jak Iwański czy Bednarczyk. Także on później, że Lazar uznał to pod koniec życia, że, że został oszukany, wprowadzony w błąd. To między innymi tą historią pierścienia, prawda? drużyną pierścienia. Sam widziałem ten pierścień w Muzeum Żabotyńskiego w Tel Awiwie. Także, ale to zamykam tą sprawę, to jest jakby tutaj mniej istotne. Trzeba po prostu sięgnąć do literatury yy, najnowszej na ten temat. Natomiast yy, mam parę takich właśnie refleksji dotyczących pani referatu o Milejkowskim i o badaniach nad głodem. Ja również jestem pod ogromnym wrażeniem tego całego projektu naukowego, który był przeprowadzony w getcie warszawskim. I e, no, taka kierownicza rola Milejkowskiego jest tutaj wspaniała. I w ogóle ta sylwetka niezwykła. Pani jeszcze tutaj nam przedstawiła te rodzinne takie konotacje biograficzne. Także to bardzo, bardzo, bardzo ładnie to wszystko e, e, jakoś zabrzmiało. No ale ja tak sobie myślę, wie Pani, bo myślę sobie o, o trochę innej stronie tych badań nad głodem. Pani tak entuzjastycznie i patetycznie przedstawiła e, tą, ten cały projekt jako taki właśnie, jako taką budowę pomnika, takiego memoriału tych e, lekarzy warszawskich z warszawskiego getta którzy no właśnie postanowili przeciwstawić się temu straszliwemu, tej straszliwej degradacji, uprzedmiotowieniu Żydów, którzy zostali właśnie wtrąceni do getta i traktowani jak przedmioty. I, i, I oni rozpoczynając te badania nad głodem, no po prostu manifestowali taką, tak, tak, taki sprzeciw prawda, przeciwko temu uprzedmiotowieniu i, i manifestowali taką, taki ten ludzki wymiar, prawda? tą niezgodę na, na, na wtrącenie w tą rolę uprzedmiotowionej ofiary. Podkreślam to uprzedmiotowienie specjalnie, ponieważ jakby z drugiej strony, od strony pacjentów, jak się na to spojrzy, prawda? od tych wybranych, pani mówiła, 70 
dorosłych, tak? Jeśli dobrze pamiętam, ja też nie pamiętam już tych liczb. I czterdziestoro dzieci, prawda? No to taka spora grupa ludzi. No jak oni byli dobierani? No oni byli zabierani z punktów dla uchodźców, prawda? E, obserwowano właśnie, kto jest w jakimś no, już terminalnym stanie. Sprowadzano do tego wydzielonego, do tej wydzielonej przestrzeni szpitalnej, tam gdzie przygotowany był ten sprzęt, prawda, do badań. No i poddawano eksperymentom medycznym, prawda? Całemu szeregowi eksperymentów. Od, na przykład no, organizowano różne typy diet i część pacjentów podzielono na takich, którym dawano tak, nam dietę białkową, prawda? I jaj, jajko podawano, In, dietę witaminową, innym jeszcze jakąś inną, prawda? No i porównywano, sprawdzano, pobierano krew, e, e, sondę żołądkową zakładano, prawda? No takie działania właśnie medyczne prowadzono, analityczne. No ale e, po pierwsze, e, nikt się tych pacjentów nie pytał, czy się na to e, godzą. Wszelkie e, takie doświadczenia medyczne, eksperymenty, wiemy, że się wybiera się na przykład jakieś próbki pacjentów do e, e, z, e, testowania leków, które są na ostatnim, w ostatnim już stadium e, e, opracowania. No, to, są, to, to są zawsze wolontariusze. Tutaj nie było wolontariuszy. To jest jedna sprawa. Tak? To, to po prostu ja jestem pełen naprawdę szacunku dla, dla tych ludzi, jestem pełen podziwu dla tego, co oni zrobili. Tylko jakby proponuję inną perspektywę, prawda? Spojrzenia. Więc to jest jedna sprawa. Druga sprawa, jeśli chodzi o no, takie fundamenty etyki lekarskiej, prawda? Te, te, ten kodeks deontologiczny lekarzy. Lekarz działa po to, żeby ratować pacjenta, prawda? żeby ratować mu życie. I testowanie różnych leków, prawda, e, e, współczesna medycyna, w, 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 znaczy to się odbywa dlatego, żeby właśnie z, 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 odkryć jakiś lek, przetestować go, lek ratujący życie. Tu sytuacja była inna jednak. Tutaj dokonywano eksperymentów na ludziach umierających. Ci ludzie umierający, a czy to, że ci ludzie umierają i że muszą umrzeć, było dla lekarzy jasne. Prawda? I no po prostu oni wykorzystali tą sytuację, o której zresztą we wstępie do choroby głodowej pisze Milejkowski bardzo jasno. E, wykorzystali sytuację getta i, i tych warunków gettowych e, no z pełną świadomością, że e, mają właśnie, że, że, że getto, to co się w getcie dzieje, właśnie ten szalejący głód daje im dużo materiału ludzkiego. Materiał ludzki to jest sformułowanie, które Milejkowski kilkakrotnie stosuje w, we wstępie do, do choroby głodowej. Więc już kończę, prawda, ale znaczy, przepraszam, że tutaj się roz, rozgadałem, ale sprawa jest niezwykłej wagi, bo sprawa dotyczy no, wymiaru etycznego tych badań, prawda? Także ja bym jakby z, trochę zamącił ten entuzjazm pani, prawda? To, troszeczkę chciałbym, żebyśmy mieli też inne, inną perspektywę. Czy mogę? Dziękuję bardzo. Mam taką propozycję, żeby zebrać pytania i potem panelistki odpowiedzą. Czy mogę? Ewa Rogalewska. Mam pytanie do pani Miri Freilich. Czy postać, chciałbym poprosić o osobistą ocenę postaci Józefa Glazmana. Czy można o to prosić na przestrzeni istnienia getta? No bardzo ta postawa się zmieniła i tak jak pani mówiła, wiele kontrowersji, zwłaszcza w tym aspekcie, kiedy był szefem policji gettowej, a potem jednak zupełnie inna postawa, jego udział też właśnie w propagowaniu kultury w getcie żydowskim. Jak, jak pani to tak całościowo, kiedy się patrzy na już zamkniętą kartę jego życia. I drugie pytanie, w getcie białostockim, a później 
osoba, która przeżyła to getto, Szymon Datner, późniejszy historyk Holokaustu, dyrektor Żydowskiego Instytutu Historycznego. Jest informacja, że był on członkiem Bejtaru i posiadał pozwolenie na broń przed wojną. No, wskazuje wszystko na to, że rzeczywiście był tym członkiem Bejtaru, bo szkolił przed wojną i tak dalej osoby młode. Natomiast później w jego, w jego czy wspomnieniach, czy dokumentach, tak jakby on się do tego nie przyznaje już. Po wojnie, jak wiemy, wyjechał w 1946 do Palestyny, powrócił. No, były tam takie sprawy, że zmienił nazwisko po drodze. I kiedy Chaim Lazar przybył do Warszawy w 1963 roku, spotkał, spotykał się między innymi właśnie z Datnerem. I czy może pani natknęła się w swoich badaniach na ten aspekt historii związanej z Szymonem Datnerem? Jeszcze jedno pytanie. Very short one uh, for Miri. Uh, it's about revisionism as a movement. As any movement, it's not solid movement from the very beginning. There is a split between traditional revisionism and Begin's revisionism. So how it's reflected in the ghetto uh, military, uh, I mean, in ghetto uprisings. Uh, you have Glasman on one hand joining FPO, you have Steinbaum who is not joining FPO and many uh, members of Kovno Jewish police are members of Beitar, Gens himself is a member of Beitar. So you have this very different approach to uh, military resistance in the ghetto. So is it a reflection of uh, disagreements within the movement or personal attitude? So now we can ask you for uh, short answers. Uh, well, um, I think it was uh, it was very important what you said, and I agree. There, there is an ethical uh, problem with the research, uh, for sure. And uh, of course, no one asked people to uh, to be uh, to participate in the research. Of course. Um, I didn't have the time to deal with the ethical uh, uh, problem about this research in 20 minutes, of course. But I totally agree, yes. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll start with the last question, because from there I'll go to, to the others. Well, uh, the revisionist movement uh, was a very complicated movement, and it went through many, many changes, and still is. You know, it, uh, even in Israel nowadays, I mean, if you try to remember its beginnings, I'm not sure that it, it has any, any connections, although the picture of uh, Jabotinsky is everywhere. Also, I'm sure that uh, our Prime Minister Bibi has his picture in the background. Um, but uh, actually, in the Vilna Ghetto, for example, there were two groups. Now, Shane Baum was not a Beitari, okay? Uh, there were others, and they were split because of personal reasons mostly, and uh, not ideological. Uh, it turned to be ideological, but eventually they all acted and uh, had the same opinions. For example, Glasman, when he came to, to the Vilna ghetto, so he was the most important figure in the ghetto because he was the head of uh, Lithuanian Beitar. And the local Vilna uh, Beitar members were sort of pushed aside because of that. And um, that's why they split. This was, there was also a personal relationship with one of the women. Anyway, so they split. And uh, the other group uh, did not uh, advocate uprising because they felt that uprising will end up in their death. They wanted to live, so they uh, said that they'll go into the forest as partisans. And they went into the uh, uh, forest in, uh, as early as April 1942. But it was too early, because the partisan movement in the forest 
was not really organized yet. So they were killed um, pretty quickly. And Glassman was part of the FPO. Now the FPO was some sort of an elitist uh, youth movement which uh, combined all the uh, youth movements in the ghetto. Now, Glassman had a very important position because he was a military man, yes, and the others didn't know much about fighting. I mean, Itzig Wittenberg was a communist, right? And the reason he was elected as the head of the FPO was because he was a communist and the Soviets were communists, so they figured that uh, in this way they could uh, connect to Russian uh, partisan or the Red Army partisans, and that's why he had, like, a, he represented the FPO. Okay, so Glasman was the military man in, in the FPO, and this uh, fact is never really, uh, was never really uh, mentioned enough. In Israel, for example, Abba Kovner, who was a, a poet and a spiritual person, is still very much admired. Uh, and actually, today, there is a conference about him in uh, Beta Tfutzot, about Abba Kovner. But uh, Abba Kovner was a very complicated person. He wasn't a fighter. He was a speaker. Actually, his wife was more of a fighter than he was. So uh, it, it is very complicated, and I could talk about this uh, for hours. If you, if you want, I'm happily to talk about it, but uh, with the limits of time. Now, uh, as to uh, Datner, um, I didn't find any information about Datner. Uh, maybe I don't remember because uh, I read the book uh, like quite a long time ago, so I, can't, I don't think he was mentioned. If he was, would have been mentioned, I would have remembered. Um, the problem with um, Warsaw's Masada written by Lazar, uh, as um, I think you, you mentioned it, that it's, you cannot prove the story depicted by Lazar. Because, as I mentioned in my um, 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 presentation, uh, most people died. But it is important, uh, definitely it, there was a group uh, organized by the revisionists uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And even Ringelblum tells about them. But uh, to what extent they were purely revisionists, I'm not so sure. It could be that there were more the other uh, people from the ghetto who joined that group, and it wasn't, you know, Beitar, only Beitar. And their connections with the Polish underground is not really clear. They definitely had some connections because they got weapons from them. Um, there were two people mentioned in different books about their leaders. One of them is Pavel Frankel, who supposedly was their leader. Another person which is mentioned by a, another Israeli historian is David Applebaum. And nobody knows who, who was the one, okay? Okay, so, but it was mentioned. Okay, so what can I say? So we don't know. I'm trying to say. Okay, but the books say that, uh, I'm glad that you know. <laughs> uh, the book said that there was such a person. So uh, it, never mind. No, I'm tr what I'm trying to say, I think I'm on your side, yes? Uh, I'm trying to say that the facts around this group are sort of not very, very clear. And I don't want to, and the reason that they are pushed now into the front of history in Israel is because, is because the, the ruling party uh, wants, wants it to be, you know, uh, wants it to be uh, important. But 
but uh, that's it. I think uh, it's time to interrupt uh, the discussion before it gets too political. Uh, but we can continue uh, during the break, uh, coffee break, and we have only 10 minutes.